Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to BIEB 152. This is the evolution of infectious diseases. And uh, today is lecture number eight, and we are going to talk about potential COVID-19 therapies that are under development. And we're going to try to anticipate whether or not those therapies um, will uh, put pressure on the virus in a way that it can overcome it with resistance mutations. Uh, so, you know, of course we don't want that, uh, but unlike antibiotics, we want to anticipate whether or not our new therapies um, will cause an evolutionary response in the virus in order for us to uh, combat it upfront to create strategies that deal with that potential rather than just closing our eyes, using a therapy and hoping for the best. So today, uh, we are not going to go over checking the temperature of COVID-19, because basically this entire lecture is checking the temperature of COVID-19. So this material, not all of it, uh, certainly not all of it, uh, but a large fraction of it uh, was actually provided by University of Washington uh, doctors. Um, and so this is David H. Spock and Gretchen uh, Newman. They provided a, a great resource, a bunch of slides online. You can search their names uh, and search slides for COVID-19. Uh, there are even more than I'm sharing today. I focused on three therapies um, rather than all of the therapies under development. These three therapies um, are a mix of promising therapies and ones that are discussed often in the news. Um, so that's why I focused on them. So therapy number one, organic compound remdesivir. So remdesivir has been in the, the news as a potential uh, therapeutic. Uh, it seems like, like a very promising one based on early tests. And this is one that we talked about in the last lecture during checking the temperature where there was um, some data that was uh, leaked to STAT, that online medical uh, journal uh, or website, news website. And uh, it looked very promising. So today I won't go over that data because it was leaked and we don't actually have it from the, the source, uh, but I will go over other data that supports that remdesivir is a potential therapeutic for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so this is just an organic compound. Sorry to everybody who took organic chemistry and it, are having flashbacks to uh, these structures. Um, but what you can see is it's, it's a fairly typical uh, organic compound. Um, and uh, it has been thought to be a broad spectrum uh, compound that uh, can fight off infections by RNA viruses. So it was originally developed for hepatitis C, uh, but it, it was shown to have low activity on hepatitis C. Uh, but it was shown to have some activity on Ebola and was used in one of the recent Ebola epidemics. And also RSV, respiratory um, virus that infects uh, children. So this RSV is something that is very common uh, as an RNA virus, uh, although we all almost have immunity to this because we get it when we're young children. So how does this drug actually work? Um, why is it a broad spectrum drug? Why does it work on RNA viruses and maybe not other viruses like DNA, DNA viruses? Um, and the reason is, is that it works on the polymerase that replicates RNA. And so remember, in a previous lecture, we had talked about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and how it replicates. And we looked at this picture where we have uh, an RNA molecule this is the, the genome of the, the virus coming into the polymerase, uh, and then a new RNA molecule being created, a copy of this, this molecule, and then this is, remember, this is the, the negative sense, and then that gets copied again into a positive sense and becomes the, the, the new genome for a progeny of this, of this virus. Don't worry about all of those details. Just remember that you know, the polymerase is making copies of the RNA, um, and what this drug does is it interferes with the production. Um, and the way that it does this, and we'll show, I'll show you a picture in the next slide, um, but the way that it does this is it mimics one of the RNA bases, adenosine. And so it mimics that adenosine 
uh, also known as ATP, and it goes and gets incorporated, or, or they think it gets incorporated into the strand, um, and then this chemical is much different than ATP, and so what ends up happening is the RNA uh, truncates early, so the polymerase is making this RNA copy, but then it breaks apart because it has this wrong chemical compound incorporated into the RNA. Um, and so then we just get these short fragments of RNA rather than long continuous segments of RNA that, that create the 30,000 base pair, roughly 30,000 base pair genome of SARS-CoV-2. This is what ATP looks like. This is one of the RNA bases. And so what the polymerase is doing is it's taking this base and it's joining it with the other bases, the, the U's, the C's, the G's, um, and they're, it's creating this long chain of RNA. Um, and so if, if it grabs one of these molecules rather than grabbing one of these molecules and tries to incorporate it into the RNA sequence, um, you can see that these molecules are very different. And so what happens is that chain of RNA is then dysfunctional and eventually has early termination. Uh, so that just means that it, it just creates a small fragment and not a long piece of its genome. Uh, so if these small fragments uh, can't come together and create a huge piece of genome, and so then the virus has a really difficult time replicating. So um, one thing that people have measured is uh, the selectivity uh, of those polymerases from different viruses and human, human polymerases um, for ATP versus remdesivir. And so the idea is that if there's any chance that the polymerase could grab one of these molecules instead of this molecule, then um, when it's replicating this long genome of the virus, uh, then it has a high probability of incorporating one of these wrong bases, the remdesivir, and causing the truncation. And so what people have measured is that um, for Ebola, and this, remember, it has some activity in, in, in treating Ebola, uh, there is, the polymerase has a preference, and it prefers ATP versus remdesivir. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it's optimized to use ATP, not to use remdesivir. Um, and uh, it prefers it four to one. And so that seems, you know, that's a, that's a, a high preference for ATP, um, but this is not high enough that the polymerase would always avoid picking up a remdesivir. And so when it's creating this long molecule, maybe most of the time it is picking up an A rather than remdesivir. But when it does pick up that remdesivir, it causes huge problems to the creation of that genome. Um, and so for RSV, which it has activity to, it has a three to one, so that's even, even better. Um, so it's favoring this even more than, than this one. Um, and then what is also great about this compound is that when they've done studies with human mitochondrial RNA polymerase, uh, it turns out that the, um, the polymerase favors ATP 500 to one of the remdesivir. And so because this is massively shifted away from these values, it suggests that um, this compound has figured out a way to more often trick viruses than to trick our own cellular machinery. And so that, that means that it's less likely to have deleterious effects uh, on us. And so it's, it's likely safe for us to use while still being able to um, purge the virus from our system and to stop the virus from, from replicating. So I want to go a little bit more into this. And so what this, what this four to one is saying is that, yeah, I mean, the, the polymerase still favors ATP over remdesivir. However, you, you can think of um, this as kind of a mutagen and you can think about it uh, in the same way that you think about mutation rates. And so there is a one in five probability that as the polymerase is going along the chain, every time it encounters an A, there's a one in five probability that it'll mutate that A and turn it into a remdesivir. 
uh, not a not a SNP like a change in the in the typical bases, but actually this this foreign um, chemical compound. And so it goes through the genome and it's replicating one in four or one in five times. It takes an A and turns it into we'll call this an R. Um, and you know there's there's only four bases, and so this is about one in every twenty bases should have this foreign compound integrated into it. That's an extremely high mutation rate, one in 20. And so it has a lot of potential to really interfere with the production of this genome. And like I said, um, it's, it's a good thing that our own polymerases are not as sensitive to the addition of this remdesivir. This I wanna sort of talk about for a second. So we have a lot of antibiotics that can fight off bacterial infections, but we have fewer antivirals. And the, the challenge with creating antivirals is that viruses take over your cell machinery. Viruses use your own genes, use your own proteins against you to produce more viral proteins, more viral RNA or DNA. Um, and so because they're using your own cellular machinery, it's really hard to find you know, that, that protein that a drug can target to wipe out the production of the virus without harming the human because it's using most of our own proteins. Um, and so what this compound is doing is it's found some difference between the polymerase of uh, these RNA viruses and the polymerase that we use in our own cells. And it has, um, has uh, used that difference as an opportunity to interfere more often with the polymerase and the virus than the polymerase that we use in our own cells. And so this is, you know, it's really thread that, that needle where, um, you know, it's, it's affecting one type of polymerase, but not the other type of polymerase. And so this is extra challenging in dealing with viruses, but, you know, there are strategies like this in order for us to combat um, these viruses. Okay. So before we actually get into the data, I need to talk a little bit about the things that uh, people measure when they're measuring these compounds that impact viral replication. Uh, and these are very similar to compounds that um, are, or, or to procedures that we use to detect the effectiveness of antibiotics as well. So these are properties that are very similar to um, what we measure for antibiotics. Although there is another bit of complexity that we didn't talk about when measuring antibiotic effectiveness. So the first step is very similar. It's this EC50, effective concentration. Uh, it's the concentration of an antiviral agent at which virus replication is inhibited by 50% in cell-based assays. Um, and so cell-based assays just mean uh, we're able to actually culture human cells and other organism cells in the lab using spe special um, uh, dishes and procedures. Uh, and so then we can run these experiments uh, where we have the viruses infect those cells and then we treat them with the compound and see if they inhibit the growth. And so that's just the first step of developing a new therapeutic is testing it on these cell-based assays. I'd just like to note that this is, very, this is conceptually similar to the MIC that we talked about the before. So it's some concentration that is just a benchmark for how much inhibition a certain concentration of drug uh, causes on a, on a viral uh, replication. So the next thing that we haven't talked about before is CC50, cytotoxic concentration. So this is a concentration of an antiviral agent required to kill 50% of the cells in uninfected culture. Okay, so what they're doing is they're not, they're not adding the virus to the cell culture, they're just adding the chemical compound and seeing how much, how high do we have to push this chemical um, in order to kill off you know, the, the cell culture human cells. Uh, and so of course, what you want is for that EC50 to be a lot, lot lower than the CC50. And that is so that you know, you're, not, you're not adding so much chemical that you're killing both the virus and the cells uh, that the virus is infecting, you'd basically be doing the work for the virus. And then you can calculate this thing called a selectivity index, which is the ratio between CC50 and EC50. Um, and it's just, it's just that, that fraction. 
uh, and of course a higher number, since CC50 is on the top, um, a higher number uh, means that uh, this is a theoretically safe uh, drug to use. And why I use the language here theoretically is because remember, these assays are being done on, in cell culture, not in humans that have complex organ systems um, and lots of interactions between different cells and cell types. Um, and so, you know, this is just the first step, um, but of course you have to do more uh, assays after that uh, in animals uh, and then eventually in humans. Okay, so this is just a cartoon, but this is just showing you what this kind of data looks like. And so what you're doing here is on the x-axis, you have drug concentration. Remember, this is a log axis. So this, this um, from here to here is an enormous, enormous difference in concentration, uh, a thousand-fold difference uh, from this point to, to that point. Uh, and what you have on the y-axis is response. And so response here is uh, ability for the, um, uh, it's the ability for the drug to inhibit the growth of, uh, of the virus. And so you can imagine that this would be viral inhibition. The pattern would just look different where low concentrations, you would have no, no inhibition at all and then higher inhibition as, as you go up. Um, so, okay. Just looking at this, um, it's showing you three different patterns, um, or the same pattern, I guess, at three different concentrations. And this just indicates that uh, here are the three different values calculated for the EC50. You see that there, this is a case where the drug has high potency, so that very low concentrations have high effect. Uh, and this is one that has low potency, so very high concentrations are required to have any effect. Um, and so obviously you want something that has high potency. And so here is the actual data um, uh, from this drug. And it was, this data is from an assay uh, with MERS-CoV. So this is not SARS-CoV-2, this is, this is older data. This is from 2017 before we even had SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they were studying MERS and they found, but I mean, this, is a, this is a very similar virus to SARS-CoV-2, um, and they found that it did have a uh, EC50 of 0 0.03 micromolar. Um, and so that's actually a very, very low EC50, EC50 and so that's, that suggests that this is, this is possibly going to work. Um, you can see that they have, they've used this particular cell type uh, 2B4, um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of cells those are, but you know, that's just to have a record and, and to standardize the, their ability to, um, to test uh, the EC50 and to see if it's uh, repeatable. And so if you take this uh, EC50 of 0 0.03 uh, and you take the, there's a re recorded uh, CC50 of greater than 100 micromolars. And so then you calculate the SI, and what you find is that you get an SI of three times 10 to the three, and it's a, an SI, that's, the, that's sort of the lower bound of the SI. The SI is actually much greater than that. And so this is a very promising drug because very little bit of it has large effect on the virus, but a lot of it is required to have big effects on human cells. Um, and this is, you know, partly due because to the fact that it targets this vulnerability of the RNA polymerase of the virus and not the RNA polymerase of uh, human cells. Okay, so let's actually get into more of the data outside of cell culture, actually now delivering this compound to human patients that have COVID-19 and seeing whether or not they respond well uh, to the therapy and whether or not it, it has a, a positive effect on suppressing the replication of SARS-CoV-2 and curing these patients faster. And so this is just one study. Uh, this is called a compassionate use study. And actually most of the data from this lecture are these compassionate use studies. This is basically where doctors are given a compound that they think might be effective against a, an infection, 
and that a patient has such a, is in such a dire situation. Um, they're on a ventilator, they're not improving. So the doctor says, you know, I, I, I don't have any other way to help this patient, but you know, there is this experimental drug and so, and I do have some of it in the hospital and so therefore I'm going to try to use it. Uh, of course you have to get, um, uh, get permission to do that, uh, but permission to use drugs during, uh, during these kinds of circumstances uh, is a lot easier to get than to use it more broadly in a more traditional sense. So we talked about compassionate care with phage therapy. There are people that have been cured with phages through compassionate care. There are not phages yet available for human use in a more traditional medical setting. So this is just the summary of the design of the, the study. Um, the background, this is, uh, we have 61 patients. Um, they received the, the drug through compassionate care. And so this is a case where we have 61 people in the study, but all of them are given the drug. And a lot of, in typical studies that are more traditional and not these compassionate care studies, you would have two groups of patients, one that you don't give the drug to and one that you do give the drug to. Uh, and then you could be able to compare those two uh, sets of patients side by side and see whether or not the drug uh, helped the outcome of the patients. But this is a very small sample size, 61. And because, you know, basically these doctors were just trying to help their patients out as much as possible, they just, and, you know, they're on the sort of edge of possibly dying, um, they just gave them all the therapy. But so I just, I'm saying all of this as a caveat that, you know, these studies are in these extreme conditions where we're just trying to throw everything at this disease and see what works uh, and trying, trying to save lives. And so they're not as controlled, they're not randomized often. Um, and so really to, to test the, these therapies, we have to do the more, a more proper experiment. Okay, so the primary endpoint, this just means like, what did they evaluate at the end of their study? This is uh, these clinical outcomes, uh, so um, changes in respiratory support, death, and whether or not they discharge the patient, whether or not the patient gets better enough to leave the hospital. Um, here's just the planned treatment. Uh, let's not worry about the specific details of that. Um, the dur duration of the uh, follow-up was 28 days later. So let's keep moving. Um, and so here is the data, or here are the data. Um, this, what do we have here? On the x-axis, we have days since initiation of the drug. Um, and then we have instances of clinical improvement. Um, and so we just have one line here. Ideally, we'd have a separate line for a control uh, set of patients, but we only have the ones that we gave the drug to. We don't have any controls. Um, but we see that on average, the patients are getting, are, are improving uh, over time, and the majority of the pa patients are, are actually improving. And so remember, these are patients that, if you're using compassionate care procedures, they're, they're likely near their deathbed or, or really struggling and unable to uh, clear the virus. Uh, and so this is looking good that the majority of them are improving in their, in their status. Um, this y-axis is a little bit opaque, um, it's based on this two points on ordinal scale. Uh, and so this is, I think, what you need to do as students uh, at this stage of your uh, training is just think of this as, you know, this is a quantitative way that doctors use to determine or these researchers use to determine whether or not the disease is improving. So the patient is improving, getting rid of the disease. Um, and the other thing that determines um, whether or not there's improvement, of course, is clinical discharge, you know, leaving the hospital healthy. So don't worry about the, the specifics of this number, um, but just see that the overall trend is that it's improving through time. Um, and so that's good. Patients aren't getting worse and uh, not, not so many patients are, are actually dying. And so let's, let's sort of put that data actually into words, into context and what, what, I, what I certainly understand a little bit better. Um, and it's this, uh, the clinical improvement was observed in 36 out of 53 patients, so 68%. I guess that's good. I would like to see something a little bit higher than that, but I guess these are really bad cases. Um, and uh, given this, you know, the, the 
issues with this study, that there's no uh, placebo control, that um, there's no uh, even control group or randomization of how they administered the compound. Uh, you know, we have to do a more thorough exam uh, evaluation of this, and um, certainly that is underway. We talked about the Gilead uh, Sciences study that part of the data was leaked, and so hopefully we have uh, much better data soon uh, from that study. So just as a matter of context, um, in this study they found that there was a 13% rate of mortality. In other studies, they found a 22% rate of mortality of patients that were in the hospital with COVID-19. So that's encouraging. It's, it's less, maybe even about half less. There is one caveat with this comparison is that you know, these were from two different populations, two different studies. Um, and the patients in this study here with the 22% mortality, uh, it appears that those patients were actually probably better off than the ones in this um, this study with 13% mortality. So that suggests that um, the drug has, a, has a, an even bigger effect than these numbers would give you a sense of. So of course, more research is required. So this is a really flimsy study, so why are we so focused on this drug? And it's in part because they've done other studies where they actually use this drug in an animal model system where they could do these proper controls and where they could really investigate the mechanism at which the drug is working and to just verify that it, it, it should work the way that we expect it to work. And so these studies are really critical um, to establishing which drugs are likely to be used. And then of course we have to make the final step and to do the studies with, with humans as well. So this is with uh, macaques. Uh, we're using MERS-CoV um, infection. And there are now three arms of the study. So we have a control. That's what I've been asking for in the, the previous study. We have prophylaxis. So what is prophylaxis? That just means that you're taking it before exposure to the pathogen. Um, this is a procedure that when I used to do research in Tanzania, you would take drugs like chloroquine, which we'll talk about in a second, continuously during your time in a zone where malaria could be. And it just gives you a little bit of an edge on the, on the pathogen uh, so that it, it's harder to infect you. Um, and so you can take this drug, they're, they're testing whether or not if you take it prophylactically, if you will reduce the possibility of an infection. And if you do get an infection, whether or not that infection is decreased. Um, and then the red, the third arm is typical treatment where you're just, you get an infection and then you administer the drug after the infection. So since this is a nice controlled study in the lab, we're able to actually manipulate whether or not you get the drug before or after uh, infection. And there's lots of different endpoints that they, that they uh, studied that we'll be able to go through in this, in this lecture. Okay, so here's just a, a visual description of how they uh, ran this study. Uh, and so they have zero is when they're actually giving the pathogen. Um, and then they have these different treatments. So obviously a control has no treatment with, um, with, the, with the drug. Um, and then this is for the prophylactic treatment here. Um, and this is for the therapeutic treatment. And then they're, they're evaluating the sickness and the disease uh, symptoms at multiple different time points throughout the study. So this is the first result. We're looking at viral load, and this is in the respiratory tracts and also uh, in the lungs. And so what we're able to do is just compare how much virus is in the organisms in the vehicle control, the, the sort of the, the normal no drugs added, the prophylactic treatment and the therapeutic treatment. So we're comparing these bars and these are error bars. They give you a sense of, you know, from one individual in the study to another individual in the study, how much variation was there in the number of viruses that were sampled in this, in this experiment. Um, and so this gives you uh, basically an estimate of error associated with making these measurements and with associated with uh, conducting this experiment. 
And then what these, what these lines here are telling you, what is the diff, is there a difference in the average viral load of this treatment compared to the average viral load of that treatment? And what these stars indicate is that these are significantly different uh, viral loads between the treatments, that this is significantly lower. And so we can trust that this uh, drug had a prophylactic effect um, in treating this, this virus. Uh, and so then we look over here. So this, is, this bracket is just comparing these two bars. And it's saying that, yes, the drug has uh, a huge prophylactic effect, um, but it also has an effect if it's used during a traditional treatment where you administer the drug after uh, the organism has been infected. So that's encouraging. Um, it's reducing the viral load, the number of viruses. Uh, so less viruses mean um, less damage to cells and less ability to spread to another um, uh, patient. Now we can look at not just the number of viruses, but what is their impact on, um, on the body of the organism? Uh, is it actually impacting the lung of the organism? So is the virus destroying the lung of the organism and does the, do these different treatments interfere with that destruction? And so what we're doing now is we're again comparing the, the control to these other treatments. Um, you can see that these means are lower uh, for both of these treatments. But because they only have one bracket here with two stars, this is saying that uh, there is certainly a significant difference in the, so we, we didn't go over the y-axis, sorry about that. Um, but this is, you can think of this as um, damage uh, to the lung. Uh, and so the higher the value, the, the more damage there is to the lung, uh, the lower, the better off the lung is doing. Um, and so you can see that in these six replicates, so that's not, that's not very many, um, there is a significant difference here. And so that's, that's a, a really good sign that even though we don't have that much power in this study because there's few replicates, um, you do see that there's a drop uh, and it, it's significant. Uh, however, uh, in the therapeutic treatment, there's a lot of variation from one uh, monkey to the other monkey. And so, and because we only have six replicates, we're unable to say definitively that there's a significant difference between this value here and that value, that, that this drug has decreased the viral load and has had a positive impact on reducing tissue damage. So uh, we can also look at these tissues uh, and see whether or not they have um, patterns that are associated with disease. And uh, this is where I am really far outside my expertise. Um, so you guys can sort of squint just like I can squint and look at this. Um, I guess sort of the patterns that we're looking for is that, you know, this is very different than this one. This has a lot less of this pink here. Um, and this is sort of an intermediate value. So it appears that not as much damage here, more damage, and more damage there. Um, and then this is a staining procedure where they're looking at these tissues and they are able to detect whether or not there are signs of the virus in the tissue um, by using this uh, polyclonal antibody um, that uh, stains the tissue when, um, when the, these virus, uh, the, the virus is around, or at least components of the virus are, are around. And so we can see that there's very little staining, more staining, and even more staining in the control. Um, and so it does appear, at least visually, that you know, these, these therapies are having an effect on reducing the virus in the lung and reducing the damage uh, that the virus is causing to the lung. Okay, so here are the results from that study. Uh, so monkeys given remdesivir either prophylactically or as a treatment had better clinical scores and fewer in <laughs> infiltrates on chest radiographs than controls. Okay, that sounds good. There was lower viral load in MERS-CoV and respiratory tract for monkeys given remdesivir. So that's good. That's the way that it's gonna help out is killing off the virus. Uh, lung pathology revealed gross lesions covering less of the lung in animals treated with remdesivir and no gross lung lesion in those given prophylactic remdesivir. 
Histologic evaluation showed normal tissue in animals treated prophylactically and less severe pneumonia in those given treatment dosing. So all of these together, very comprehensive study, an animal model study uh, shows that at least with on mers cov 2 in this animal, this drug has significant effects um, and is likely a, a good therapeutic. So that's um, what the conclusion is here, that um, uh, we should move ahead with testing out this drug uh, in humans. So the question is, and I think that this is actually a very promising drug, um, and even though the data are still a little bit slim on the drug, we will get more data soon. Um, but the question is, is there any evidence that if we start to administer this drug, we are going to actually select for SARS-CoV-2 to be resistant to this drug. So we know from experiences with things like HIV that HIV quickly evolved resistance to the first round of drugs uh, created to combat it. Um, and so that was, I think, AZT. And there was AZT resistance that evolved very rapidly. And so if we only have this one drug, what will happen if we administer it and we administer it at a high rate uh, in our population? Are we just going to be selecting for SARS-CoV-2 that's resistant to this drug, making our compound uh, absolutely useless? And so the, the, the sort of punchline is that there are already um, studies that have been done on related viruses using compounds similar to remdesivir uh, that suggests that resistance is able to evolve very rapidly um, within this virus. Okay, so let's just go over the details of this one study. And so they are using a compound that's similar to remdesivir um, that they've shown has similar uh, chemical properties and similar impacts on, on viruses. They uh, were studying uh, a coronavirus in the lab uh, murine hepatitis virus. Uh, so this is just a model coronavirus that's a lot easier to use uh, in the lab uh, and certainly was around for doing studies like this before we had SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you are making, uh, if you're extrapolating from this study, uh, you have to make a few assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that uh, the drug will behave in the same way and for this virus as with SARS-CoV-2 and that the same resistance mutations will, evol will evolve in SARS-CoV-2 as they evolved in this related virus uh, in this lab experiment. Um, and so let's, let's go over the, so here's the compound. Um, we can see that during these studies, as we uh, increase the concentration of the compound, uh, we decrease the viral titer. So that's just uh, the, the numbers of viruses in the uh, experimental treatments. And so that's positive, that's, that's what we expect to see. This is calculating um, that EC50. Uh, and so what we see here is that, you know, if you're adding in just very small amounts of this compound, uh, you're not having much inhibit, inhibitory effect. Uh, and then finally, there's a sort of threshold where um, you can get up to 100% um, inhibition of the, of the virus. Um, and so the EC50 would be where this line crosses here. Um, and so it's, it's not the exact same concentration as the previous study that I talked about. Uh, it's a little bit higher. Uh, however, you know, this, is, this is a different study, different compound, different uh, cell culture and so forth. Um, but so there's a little bit of variation, a little bit of dependence on those properties. But the point is, is that this is still uh, a pretty low concentration. Um, and then they looked at cell viability. Um, this is percent of DMSO control. What that means is DMSO is just the solvent that you often deliver um, the compound in. And so as your control, you, you give the cells the same amount of DMSO uh, just without the compound, and that's your control uh, in case the DMSO has any negative impact on the cells. And so you can see that actually at very high concentrations of this drug, there seems to be very little impact on the uh, viability of the cells. And so that tells you that, um, just like we learned before, that the, the SI, the selectivity index, this ratio uh, 
CC50 divided by EC50, and 50 is for 50% inhibition. So um, we see again that the selectivity index is very, very high, and so this is promising. This, drug, this compound is behaving very similarly to remdesivir. And so it can be used uh, in the study to see um, what, what is likely to happen when we actually use this uh, therapeutic compound. And so here are results. The study is very comprehensive and looks into lots of different properties of this compound uh, and how it works. Um, I'm just going to focus on the aspects of the evolution. And so here is the figure that summarizes uh, the characteristics of the mutations that they found later are actually conferring resistance to um, this remdesivir-like compound. And so if you remember, this is the structure of the genome of SAR, uh, coronaviruses. Um, and we're gonna focus in on these genes here. This is, uh, this is for the polymerase. Um, and so obviously that's where the, the, um, the compound acts. And so that's most likely where resistance mutations are going to evolve. So this is, so this, pattern here is zooming in on this region of the genome. So these are just the, um, the, the genes and how they're organized um, in this region of the genome. We're focusing in on two particular uh, regions here. So there's lots of different structures to this, to this protein and to this gene. Let's not worry about those different structures. What we need to worry about is just that there's a mutation here and there's a mutation here. Um, that we think are, are conferring resistance uh, to this drug. And so here is, so that gene encodes for this polymerase protein. Here's a segment of that polymerase um, where we're able to, and so the, the colors of these different structures of this protein uh, correspond to the different segments of the gene over here. Um, and so what we're looking at is, this is a prediction of the, the protein structure of the polymerase. Um, and the, the researchers have identified three features. This is where the um, drug actually binds the protein and interferes with the, um, the protein uh, producing the RNA strand. Uh, and then here are the amino acids in the protein uh, that are mutating and changing from a V amino acid to an L or an F amino acid to an L. Um, and so this is at position 553 in the peptide, and this is position 476 in the peptide. Um, and so these mutations correspond to these sequence alignments of the peptide of different uh, viruses. And so these are all coronaviruses, and they're all uh, closely related to each other. Um, and what we can see is that you know, the amino acid sequences differ. So what, what this is showing you, and we're going to look at a lot of these, uh, these um, amino acid or DNA alignments, uh, and I'll explain them much more in the future. We have to start out with these alignments to look at differences between sequences to identify whether or not there are mutations and whether or not these um, proteins or these genes have, have actually evolved. And so you can see that there are differences, like this N to Y, Y, D, N, like this is a highly variable um, uh, portion of the protein. This amino acid tends to vary. But then there's other places that there's less variation. And what we find is that at the sites where we see mutations, so those are the ones that are highlighted uh, in red, at those sites, we actually see that there's really strong conservation of these amino acids. And so um, that indicates two things to us. One is that if this is the site that mutates in order to confer resistance to this drug, um, and yes, we're, we're, we're not doing the study on SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV-2 uh, likely has the exact same amino acid. So here's SARS-CoV, uh, has the same amino acid here. Uh, then you know, it has the, an opportunity uh, to mutate just like the one in this study, in order to uh, confer resistance. Uh, and so that's also true uh, with this V 
But what it also means is that there has likely been purifying selection acting on these amino acids uh, to, to maintain that particular amino acid in that position, in that protein. And so that's, that's a case where natural selection says, oh, this is a good amino acid. I want to keep this here. And so if it mutates away, natural selection weeds that out of the population. And so these conserved sites uh, or conserved positions in a protein are ones that the, the virus doesn't want to change those. And so if your drug, um, if evolving resistance to your drug requires changing those sites, then that's going to be bad for the virus. Uh, and so that's, that's really where you trap the virus so that you know, it's, it's harder for it to evolve resistance to your drug. So that's really promising. Just looking at these, these gene sequences or these, these peptide sequences, you can see that this, this is likely a very good uh, drug to use uh, in order to, to avoid the, the pathogen from evolving resistance to the drug. And so there's, in the paper, there's a lot of data that suggests that these mutations actually are conferring resistance. I should say that I forgot to mention that these mutations evolved in the lab they evolved within four weeks, I think sometime between three and four weeks of culturing the virus in the lab um, with, the, with the drug. Uh, so they evolved very rapidly. That usually is an indication that they are giving the virus a huge benefit. Um, and that huge be benefit is actually the ability to resist the drug. And so what we see here is that we have concentration of the drug. Um, and uh, on the y-axis, we have percent inhibition again. Uh, we're comparing wild types. So this is a virus that doesn't have the mutations to a virus that does have the two mutations. And we can see that inhibitory concentration has shifted to the right um, consistently uh, along this whole gradient of drug dosages, which suggests that um, this virus is actually now much more resistant to the therapy. And so is like more likely to survive if we are giving patients remdesivir. And so this, this, the difference between those lines might not look that severe, uh, but remember that this is a log axis here. And so you know, really subtle differences on this axis actually translate to pretty large differences in drug dosage. Um, so that's, that's bad news. These, these mutations actually do uh, confer resistance, and they evolve very rapidly under laboratory conditions. Now, laboratory conditions are not nearly as complex as infecting a patient. Uh, infecting a human, you have lots of, you know, you have different tissues and different cell types, and you have the immune system hunting you down. And so often, mutations in the lab have a really negative impact on the fitness of the virus or bacteria under normal uh, clinical conditions. And so hopefully, with these mutations, because they do occur in these conserved sites, so there's, they're thought to uh, cause pleiotropic costs on viral replication, um, hopefully when that virus is replicating in a much more difficult environment, in a host, um, and not in a petri dish, that that virus is further handicapped, making these two mutations more difficult to evolve. So that's our hope. So that's our hope. But you know, given that in this very small lab experiment, really rapidly, the virus found multiple mutations that help it confer resistance uh, to this therapeutic, we have to worry about the evolution of resistance. And so how should we avoid the evolution of resistance? Uh, we have talked about different strategies but often they involve having multiple different compounds to be able to treat a single infection or having multiple different you know, synthetic biology strategies uh, to reverse antibiotic resistance or reverse resistance to this, uh, this therapy. Um, but obviously this is just the first therapy that we're even developing for COVID-19. And so we don't have all of those different strategies. So the way that I would go about using remdesivir in order to avoid 
having the evolution of resistance and rendering this therapy useless is that I would just use remdesivir in clinical settings. I would not give it out to the general population, just the people that are in the hospital that have a very severe case of COVID-19. So covet this chemical for just the worst cases. And then also what I would do is I would take those patients that are getting remdesivir and I'd completely isolate them. And the idea here is that you're creating a dead end for the evolution of this virus. So you isolate the patient away from everybody else. If the virus gets a mutation that confers resistance to this drug, then that patient still, still may not die uh, because they still have an immune system that can help fight off the, the virus. Um, but no matter what, that patient is completely isolated and that virus then can't be transported from that patient to infect somebody else and then spread you know, in a chain uh, to a bunch of other people now spreading around this resistance mutation and rendering our therapeutic useless. Uh, what I would also do is I would, when I was uh, developing new therapeutics, so there's, you know, you can augment the shape um, and the chemical properties of this, this compound, um, and hopefully you can augment them and engineer them in ways that they're not just effective at the wild type virus, but they're also effective at viruses that have these two mutations. And so that's sort of engaging in this technological arms race with the virus, where the virus is mutating, and then we're staying one step ahead with our, with our therapies because we can anticipate what the virus is going to do. So I think these are very clear examples of how upfront you can try to anticipate evolution and implement strategies ahead of time that interfere with the evolution of resistance. Okay, now we're going on to uh, therapy number two. Uh, and these will be a little bit faster because there's less information on these next two therapies. So this therapy is controversial. This is hydroxychloroquine. And um, it's controversial because uh, people have suggested that it should be effective at um, uh, uh, dealing with SARS-CoV-2, um, but the data for its effectiveness are really, really slim. And so it might be this case where we're hoping for a positive outcome, and that's actually manipulating our perception and our behaviors and how we're treating patients. And we actually do need better data to um, determine whether or not this is actually effective and whether or not this drug has bad side effects. Okay, so what is this drug? It was originally developed to treat malaria. Uh, malaria is not a virus. It's, malaria is not even a bacteria. Malaria is a single-celled eukaryote, so it's a really weird organism. You know, it's more like a yeast than a bacteria or, or certainly than a virus. It infects blood. It doesn't infect your respiratory tract. It uses uh, red blood cells. So this is a, a malarial cell that is taking advantage of a red blood cell. These are, of course, we'll talk more about malaria later in the course. They tend to be in the tropics and in Africa and in East Asia. And uh, we've been developing drugs and strategies to deal with them for a very long time. And chloroquine and now hydroxychloroquine are, are the drugs that we've developed to deal with it, this pathogen. And often people use this prophylactically, like we talked about earlier in the lecture. And so this is a really different organism and its infection mechanism and why it actually infects in our body is, is very different than SARS-CoV-2. So I had heard about this using this compound and I just had huge skepticism. However, you know, you have to be open to any strategy that might be therapeutic and maybe there's some way that this compound interacts with our immune systems so it causes a response that kills off malaria, but it also causes a response that kills off SARS-CoV-2. You know, you often we don't know how these things are actually acting in the body, and so it's hard to make a prediction of whether or not the therapeutic effects will be transferable to uh, other diseases. Okay, so we're going to go with this study. This is an early study, low N, only 36 patients. It was conducted in France. It, it was a controlled study, and it had the delivery of this compound with a second compound in some of the treatments. That's this azithromycin. Let's just look at the results. Before we get to the results, let's, let's talk about the design of the study a little bit more. 
Um, and so this is, this is actually, you know, this is a very modern study. March 2020 is when it was published. And so this is actually with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's not um, like in the other cases where we had other infections. Um, we're dealing with other viruses and hoping that they have the same impact as SARS-CoV-2. We're actually dealing with SARS-CoV-2 here. N just means the number of people in the study. Uh, we have 36 people in this study. So 16 were given standard care, 26 were given hydroxychloroquine, um, but six of those 26 were also given the second compound. Um, the compounds were delivered uh, at day zero through six. This is the endpoint, and this is when they, they evaluated the, the study. And uh, some people had to drop out of the study for various reasons. Uh, so in the end, we have n equals 16 for the control and n equals 20 uh, for the, the actual treatment with uh, hydroxychloroquine. And so there, you can look at the study. There's lots of different uh, results. Here are pretty straightforward results that seem very significant to me. And so it's saying that this is a time series of these patients. Um, and what they're recording is the percentage of the patients that are negative for SARS-CoV-2. We're using polymerase chain reaction PCR uh, to determine whether or not there is a trace of DNA in the samples isolated from these different patients. We're not looking for DNA, we're looking for RNA of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so this is a, a very standard way of looking for, for viruses and samples is to use this polymerase chain reaction uh, in order to detect low concentrations of viral RNA, or it can be used for DNA as well. Okay, and so we see that, you know, this looks very promising. Consistently through the entire course of the study, uh, the ones that were receiving hydrochloroquine were often negative for the virus. And, you know, you always want to sort of look at trends in studies. And there's this great trend where over time, you're seeing uh, more and more people becoming negative for the virus. And so that would suggest that there is some kind of therapeutic property that as you're administering it, it's enhancing uh, the ability to clear the virus more and more uh, each day. And whereas the standard care, uh, you know, these numbers are kind of all over the place. First off, they're very low. And so people during this short time scale are not uh, curing, are not being cured of the the pathogen unless they're being administered the drug. Um, and we don't see like a clear progression where you go from you know, very few negative cases to more um, negative cases. Uh, it just seems that there's kind of a low level of negative cases. So this infection is without any intervention by hydroxychloroquine is causing this persistent infection that lasts for six days in, in this study and that patients really aren't clearing the infection naturally. Uh, other researchers have pointed out uh, many methodological limitations of this study. We have small sample size. The viral clearance as PCR technique was unvalidated at the time. Uh, there is a lack of randomization or blinding, so the patients knew that they were getting the chloroquine. Uh, there are confounding there are confounding factors by selection of treatment group from a single center and control group from multiple centers. Um, so basically, all of the patients that were given the drug were from one place, but the control group were from all over the place. And if they had picked up some patients in a center that maybe tended to have older patients or more sick patients, uh, then it would skew the results and, buy, and even bias the results uh, in the direction that um, that they showed. And so that, that's not good. You want to compare apples to apples. Uh, patients and treatment groups were further along in their disease course than control patients. Um, and so this is suggesting that um, maybe the patients that were given the chloroquine uh, were actually very far along in the disease progression. And so they were already on the path to clearing the virus naturally, that the compound did not actually have an effect itself and that patients were um, with the most serious and clinically relevant outcomes, ICU admission, death, were excluded from analysis. So they use these on patients that uh, were not as bad off as a lot of patients with COVID-19. And so it, it just calls into question even the relevance of, of using it if it can't help out the most severe cases. 
So since that study was released and there's all this controversy over whether or not we should use it, uh, certainly some hospitals in the San Diego area have stockpiled this. Uh, some patients that use this, uh, not for malaria, but for it has uh, beneficial effects on arthritis, are having a harder time finding this drug because people are stockpiling it. And so there's all this controversy. People think that it works, but maybe it doesn't work. And so people want to get to the bottom of this. And so there's been two new studies in France, and one had negative results and one had positive results. So we're all over the place there. Uh, there was a study done in the United States, which with much larger sample sizes, and this study has not been peer reviewed yet. Uh, so it hasn't been assessed by other scientists besides the ones that actually ran the study. And so it's important to have studies be peer reviewed, but we also need information very quickly and the peer review process takes a while. And so we're given these studies as preprints on med archive. Uh, so we can look at the data ourselves and evaluate it ourselves. And what this study found is that given this much larger sample size and the different patients that were being treated in the United States, it doesn't appear that hydroxychloroquine has any beneficial effects and it actually might have bad side effects. So it's not just good to take compounds because you think they might cure you uh, because those compounds could have bad side effects. And so here's a table of results. Okay, so we have different treatments, the HC treatment, the HCAZ treatment. Here's the description, so hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine with the second drug, uh, and then no HC is the, is the control treatment. You can see that the ends are much higher um, than the previous studies. And so here are two outcomes that they monitored for uh, death. And what we really wanna look at is percentage, not total numbers. Um, the reason is because the total ends for each of these treatments vary in size, and so comparing the numbers between them is kind of like comparing apples and oranges. What you want to compare is the, the percentages, so the values in the brackets. Uh, and what we find is that in this treatment, we have 27.8% death, 22.1% death, and 11.4% death. Um, so less, even, even less than half of what's in this treatment in the control treatment where we're not giving the drug and uh, they can do statistics and they say that the difference between these treatments is significant. That means that people were more likely to die when they were given the drug. So this is, you know, it's clearly not improving the condition of these patients and it might actually be negatively impacting the patient's condition. And the discharge rate shows a, a similar pattern as well where the most patients are discharged um, during this study when they are not administered the drug. And so this is obviously not promising for this drug. And so people should, should be hesitant to, to use this drug until we have better data. Okay, so here are the conclusions from that study. We found no evidence that the use of hydroxychloroquine reduces the risk of mecha uh, mechanical ventilation in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 uh, and it actually increased overall mortality. And so at the very end of this conclusion, there's this disclaimer saying that while this was a better study than those studies in France, this is still not the definitive study. That these studies are all being done in this pandemic situation where doctors are rushing around to use in these medicines and to try to find, figure out whether or not they work and that these are not ideal circumstances for running these drug trials. And so there are ongoing drug trials that are better controlled, better randomized, with double blind procedures and with accounting for placebo effects and things like that. And so, you know, we will have the definitive outcome of these studies soon. We don't have it yet. But as far as I can tell, this does not look like a compound that you should take for COVID-19. Should we also expect that the virus could evolve resistance to the chloroquine? And, you know, I don't really have much uh, data to go on here uh, because this drug has been used not for viruses, but for this eukaryotic uh, parasite. But what I can, can tell you is that when this drug was administered back in the 1950s or even earlier, but resistance began to evolve 
uh, in Asia in the 1950s, and then it spread around the world. Um, and so now, people rarely use this drug for malaria because most of the malarial parasites in the world are resistant to the drug. And so this is just a, from a re review article of how this uh, resistance spread um, from Asia into Africa. Uh, it appears that there's a second, uh, another wave of resistance that evolved that spread around in South America. So, you know, these are very different organisms, but it, it suggests that there probably are weaknesses, ways that organisms can evolve their proteins to avoid the therapeutic effects of hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so therapy number three, convalescent plasma. This is a therapy that actually has been shown to be very effective. It is a very strange uh, therapeutic. So let's just go through what exactly is plasma. We can donate blood, and often when we donate blood, uh, they separate out uh, the red blood cells, and so these are good for patients that uh, you know, have obviously bled a lot and need a replenishment of red blood cells. And then this plasma has other components in it that are good for other purposes. So this is a list of all of the stuff that's in the, in the plasma. What is often in the plasma are antibodies, uh, immunoglobulins that help to fight off disease. Uh, and so often you can separate the plasma and then treat patients with the plasma. So you can separate those things out. And the way that the separation happens is basically people come in and they get strapped up to a machine, aphoresis machine, that separates out the red blood cells from the plasma. Um, and basically you're, you have kind of two tubes stuck in your different arms. One is taking out blood, then this, the plasma is being filtered out and separated, and then uh, your blood, red blood cells are coming back into your, your other arm. And this is so that they can get a lot of the plasmid out uh, without having you know, really negative effects on you. Uh, because they, they give you back your, your red blood cells so you obviously need. So the idea here is that uh, you could take uh, a person that had, was infected with SARS-CoV-2, now has antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, so it ha that patient had a, an immune response, and now that immune system of that patient has learned uh, pr to produce these antibodies that will interfere with SARS-CoV-2 and destroy it. And so that, that patient uh, healed because of this immune response. And so now what we're doing is we're just taking what that patient's immune system did and we're transferring that to another person, um, hoping that, that, that we transfer those antibodies and that in this new person on this, new, this different strain of SARS-CoV-2, it will have therapeutic effects and will help cure the patient from having uh, COVID-19. And so there's actually been two studies, very small sample size in both studies. Uh, this is really laborious to be able to find a patient that has definitely been cured, that has these antibodies, you know, go through this process of getting the plasma and then delivering it to a new patient. But people have done this study, and there are two studies, and they seem promising. So uh, this is a uh, biologic. That just means that it's not this sort of um, organic compound. This is you know, this, this antibody, which is produced by our own bodies, which is uh, a more complex. Uh, its approval status is that it's available in emergency situations. It's an investigational new drug, that's IND, um, and you have to get clearance from the FDA to use it. Its mechanism is what we've talked about already, basically transferring immune system uh, particles from one person to another person and hoping they help cure the second person. This kind of treatment has been shown to be effective for other viruses, H1N1, that's influenza, um, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, so that's, that's promising. It works uh, for these other related coronaviruses. And they have been shown to decrease the viral burden and also the mortality. And uh, one other caveat is that uh, this is a case where early treatment is much more effective than late treatment. Um, you can understand that just in that in late treatment, there's lots and lots of viruses uh, for the immune system to act on. 
and there's a limited number of these antibodies that are transferred from one patient to another patient. And so if you have tons and tons of viral particles swarming your body, um, there just won't be enough antibodies to, to wipe them out. So this is just going back to the, the experimental design of this first experiment. Um, and here are the results. Uh, so we have very few patients, so one, two, three, four, five patients uh, were in this study, and this is days post-transfusion on the x-axis, and CT value, this is related to viral detection. You can read through what exactly it means, um, but basically that polymerase chain reaction used to detect the virus, you perform that reaction in cycles, and typically it's about 40 cycles, and so if you don't get any kind of um, reading from that PCR reaction uh, within 40 cycles, then it's determined that the virus is not present in your sample. And so what we can see is that multiple time points throughout the experiment, one, three, seven, and 12 days post-transfusion, they were looking for the virus and all of the patients eventually by 12 days uh, had undetectable levels of the virus. Uh, and so it seems that you know, they, they were doing very well and had cleared the virus and that this plasma was having a real effect. Uh, so here are just um, some summary of all of the different uh, results from that study. So I guess I wanna say is that three of the five patients were discharged and two are stable um, at day 37 in the hospital. So that's looking good. That is a high level of success. Although note, this is very few, very few patients in the study. So now they've improved two aspects of the study. Um, it's, it's conceptually very similar, um, procedurally very similar as the, the previous one. Uh, the difference is that they are verifying that their donors of blood and plasma uh, have a very high level of neutralizing antibodies. Um, and so they're actually able to give a smaller volume, half of the, the fraction of plasma as they gave before, um, hopefully with the same or even higher therapeutic effect because they have this verification that the antibody level is very high. Uh, and in this time, I think there's 10 different patients that they administered the therapy to. And so here are the results again, uh, lots of details, but the sort of take home message is that all of the patients were discharged or progressed to discharge, that they all seem to be doing good. 10 out of 10 is a very high success rate um, for how bad COVID-19 is and how bad um, the patient's conditions were when they were getting the plasma. So this looks like a very promising procedure, and I think we're going to see more and more of it for a number of reasons, but also partly because more and more people are getting cured of uh, COVID-19, and so more and more people have these antibodies, so hopefully people can will donate blood, get the plasma, and, and give it to patients that are really struggling with COVID-19. Of course, uh, right now there is a, uh, a problem in that not as many people are donating blood, uh, so if you can, please donate blood, and certainly if you've already um, had COVID-19 and are cured, um, definitely donate your plasma. Um, that's a different procedure uh, where they filter out the red blood cells and give them back to you. Uh, but definitely go to the hospital and make sure that they, that they know that you have already had COVID-19. Okay, so it is difficult to see how this therapy would really scale up because it's so labor intensive to get the plasma, but it does seem very promising. And the mechanism with how it works makes sense. So it's, it's pretty trustworthy. So do we have to worry about the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 to be resistant to this kind of therapy? So what the immune system is doing is it's learning the proteins of this virus and it's targeting those specific proteins, not your own proteins, um, and it's killing off those, those proteins and those viruses. It's basically glomming them up so they can't function. And so uh, one problem could be is that if SARS-CoV-2 is evolving uh, and you have these different strains and they have different proteins, then um, if you're taking plasma from patients from different regions of the world or just that had infections earlier in the pandemic and now the strain has evolved and changed, then the plasma and the antibodies are unlikely to be able to target the new proteins, the evolved proteins, 
in uh, the strains of SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, when you look at the phylogeny, this is from that nextstrain.org that I keep showing. When you look at this phylogeny, it suggests that um, you know, there is genetic diversity and even different regions of the world appear to have very different strains. And so the color coding is, is for the different regions of the, the globe um, that have this pandemic. And so that would suggest, well, maybe, you know, maybe it is evolving a lot and maybe there are distinct strains now and, and we have to be nervous about this. But actually, when you look under the hood a little bit, and so this is, a, this is the same evolutionary relationship, just sort of kind of messier, um, where you have on the x-axis, you still have time, um, but now you have number of mutations. You see that even the most unique strain um, only has about 17, 18 mutations in it um, compared to the original strain that was spreading around Wuhan. And even nowadays, you can see that there are lots of instances where we're sequencing viruses that are infecting people um, that haven't had any single mutations, but most of them have had some mutations. And it, it appears that the substitution rate is uh, you know, about 26 per year, so about two mutations per month this virus is accumulating. Remember, this virus has a lower mutation rate than a lot of other RNA viruses. And so it is actually mutating much slower and evolving much slower than many other diseases. And so it doesn't seem like it's accumulating enough variation so that if we use, say, this original strain, if a patient was infected by this original strain and created some antibodies, and then we have a patient that has one that has 18 unique mutations, these are probably not enough differences to be able to avoid the antibodies from, from this patient down here. And so I would say that this, this seems like a pretty robust strategy given um, how slowly this, this virus is actually changing. And so this is the um, last little bit of this lecture. We didn't talk about vaccines. Um, and there's some question of whether or not when we get a vaccine, I think we will get a vaccine in like a year, whether or not that will be a very effective vaccine. Um, we know that often the influenza vaccine doesn't work as well because um, basically influenza evolved so quickly and there's so many different strains of influenza that it's hard to develop a really robust vaccine to influenza because they're specialized for these different strains, isolated at different time points in history. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's hard because the virus is always evolving very rapidly. However, this virus evolves much less rapidly and all of the sequenced genomes in this virus are actually very similar to each other. And so when we do develop a vaccine, it seems like it'll have really high effectiveness across the board on all of these different strains from all around the world. Uh, and hopefully the virus won't change fast enough that that vaccine maintains its therapeutic properties uh, long into the future. And so it would, be, it would behave more like the measles vaccine than like the influenza vaccine. So, okay, thank you guys, take care.